I suppose I was 14, he was 23, therefore he's sort of more our generation, and he came straight from Oxford, and at the time when people from Oxford were sort of going into broadcasting and journalism, so he knew famous people who were going into the BBC and things. So he, he was very worldly, and uh, but a marvellous teacher. I mean, it was like going into a, into a cabaret, frankly, going into his lessons, because he used to act out all the parts himself and read Chaucer and read Shakespeare, and, uh, you know, wonderfully, because he, he was a great actor himself. So, yes, he was just a wonderful teacher. Life is a lot of if-onlys, if-onlys. I mean, if only I hadn't say, got a place at Cambridge University. I wouldn't have been editor of Varsity, the newspaper, and I wouldn't have got to ITN, and I wouldn't have then gone to Yorkshire Television, and I wouldn't have done Calendar, and then I wouldn't have done Calendar Countdown, and I wouldn't have done Countdown, and then I wouldn't be here. (laughs) So I owe it all, really, to getting a place at Cambridge University, which Russell uh, helped me get because of his excellent teaching of English. ITN in 1965, then. Very different ITN to the uh, the one we know today, of course. Well, it was, of course. It was very pioneering. It was small. It was very energetic. I mean, it was full of the scoops. It was very lively. It was full of characters, the real personalities, of course, the the great newsreaders. Uh, we always remember Reginald Bosenkett, Reggie Bosenkett, the mm. cheeky smile there, and great authoritative figures, Alistair Burnett, big Andrew Gardner, six foot four, Peter Snow, huge, you know, Gordon Honeycomb. They were all giants, all these newscasters. The only titch was Reggie. Quite daunting place to go and work then, Well, was I, was, it? I was terrified. I mean, I was a trainee, age 21, and uh, quite honestly, a lot of the, the old timers there who gone up the proper journalists, the real journalists. They didn't like little twits like me coming in, you know, on the, you know, from straight from university. So it was, it was quite a daunting. Time. Life wasn't made easy for me for there. I can tell you, you know, it was, it was, I was a lot of sleepless nights and worrying about the next day. Now somebody told me, I don't know if this is true or not, but I understand your your first job at Yorkshire Television was to report on a Leeds United game. Oh wasn't goodness it, in gracious! Europe? Yes, it was. I mean, <laughs> absolutely. Well, Yorkshire TV went on the air on the Monday. And on the Wednesday, Leeds United were in Europe, and I had to, uh, I had to report from the game. And there was film in those days, and it was a late afternoon kickoff. It just wasn't time to get the film back, so they said I had to go to the match, then come back and give a report. Well, not only had I never been to a football match, Martin, I'd never played football, <laughs> uh, I'd never appeared on television live before, and it was just absolutely terrifying. So I rang up Reggie Bosenkett at ITN, and I said, Reggie, I've got to, can you give me a tip, please? He said, Well, he said, what are you going to do, old boy? Just get the first line out, get the first line absolutely correct and then the rest will follow so so I think good advice so coming back in the taxi I said compose the first line uh, it was a tightly fought game with Billy Bremner dominating the attack it was a tightly fought game with Billy Bremner dominating the attack so I got that in mind when I got there at the studio at five to six they were waiting for me come in come in and then they said to me just for sound level what's your first line I said uh, it was a tightly fought game with Billy Bremner dominating the attack that's fine then the floor manager said, uh, oh, just we just need the queue. What's your first line? So I said, it was a tightly fought game with Billy Bremner dominating the <laughs> attack. And so it went on three or four times I said this. And th- we were on the air. And Austin Mitchell, my great friend, mm. was, the, was the presenter. And uh, we had the, the opening of the programme and the news. And I was getting more and more nervous. It was a tightly <laughs> fought game with Billy Bremner dominating the attack. <laughs> my parents were watching. All, all my people I'd grown up with in Bradford and everything. So he came, Austin Mitchell, now football, a big match at Ellen Road, the uh, second leg of the third round of the Intercity Fairs Cup, Leeds United versus Munch and Gladbach. Uh, our sports reporter, <laughs> our sports <laughs> reporter Richard Whiteley, has just come back from Ellen Road where he tells me it was a tightly fought game with Billy Bremner dominating the attack. <laughs> Over to you, Richard. <laughs> so what did you say? Can you remember? Oh, history doesn't relate. I mean, oh, Austin, what a beast he was. What a beast. <laughs> I said at the very beginning that uh, Richard Whiteley, un- unbriefed, has given us a- another sort of side to your journalistic skills and interviewing qualities, which perhaps only people in Yorkshire uh, television areas had seen before. Well, I mean, yes, I've been, uh, as uh, when a two of you may know, and you will know, because you've been in the broad acres, but uh, I was the presenter of Calendar, mm. uh, the Yorkshire TV six o'clock local programme for many years, which involved doing a lot of political interviewing and chat show type interviewing and outside broadcast type stuff. So I had a wide experience of all genres of TV. But obviously people outside Yorkshire uh, just know me as, as presenter of Countdown. The team that you mentioned, you already mentioned Austin Mitchell, uh, quite a few famous people. In fact, I often wonder if there's some sort of chat show host production centre in Yorkshire, because you mentioned Russell Harty and, of course, Michael Parkinson as well. You know, I guess Wogan is, is probably one of the few who doesn't come from that part of the world. No, I don't, I don't think Terry does come from that part no, of the world. Not Money. quite. He does, he does do a mean Yorkshire accent, you know. He's quite good at it, I have to say. And he's the one who coined the phrase twice nightly whitely, of course. Well, he's... I, he, 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 he immortalised it. He's brought it to a wider audience. I mean, I call Terry my PR man, actually, because hardly a day goes by 
without him uh, ridiculing me in some form or other. I'm singing deck or everything. Now, twice nightly, I've had to remind him that at my... I don't know what, what he means by it, but if he, if, if, if he means what I think he means by it, I have to remind him that at my age, rather like him too, probably, it's not twice nightly, but once yearly nearly. You've said um, in your book, and it's on record anyway, that um, you do look up to people like Michael Parkinson and, um, and David Frost as well is a name we haven't mentioned. Sort of heroes of yours, in a sense? Absolutely. David Hop Frost, a uh, great hero of mine. I mean, I first encountered him, as we all did, I suppose, on That Was the Week That Was in the 60s, 1963. He'd just left Cambridge. He was a great legend at Cambridge. And, of course, the streets are everywhere. Cambridge certainly emptied on Saturday nights. We all watched That Was the Week That Was. So I followed him throughout his career as an interviewer. He's a great interviewer. His Nixon interviews were super, and he's like some of his live confrontation interviews. He's been a wonderful contributor, I think, to the history of television. And, uh, you know, you just can't knock him down. I mean, you know, I mean, he, if he's not doing uh, breakfast time, he's doing through the keyhole, or if he's not interviewing prime ministers, he's interviewing, you know, pop stars. You know, he's, he's, he's just terrific. Or Guinness Book of Record holders. He, I think he's a great man. Now, what about the uh, years on calendar? What were the highlights for you? Because uh, certainly one of the things I remember was um, one particular edition of It'll Be All Right on the Night with the <laughs> ferret. But um, there were many more highlights than that, well, I'm sure. I suppose. <laughs> I mean, it was a live show, because it still is, obviously, but uh, I don't know, I think one tends to think... In, in the olden days, do you remember when newscasters had phones on their desks? Yeah, and they, when the phone used did... to ring, didn't they? Yes, yes, they used to ring. Now <laughs> that was great, you see, because a it rang and it gave you something to do, you know, a bit of business, and it gave them five or ten seconds to get organised in the control room while they sorted it out. Now, of course, you have an earpiece, which so you can hear that uh, there's chaos in the control room or things aren't going to happen. It's not quite the same, is it? So I used to love all that sort of um, uh, pre-earpiece days. You really were flying by the seat of your pants. So every night we thought was a bit of a first night. It was, you know, we were, it was just so exciting. Now, I suppose the thing that changed your life was that uh, four-week trial run of a game show on Channel 4. Uh, first night, 3.8 million. Mm. Second night, just 0.8 million. <laughs> We lost the... Th no, just point eight of a million, you know? We lost the three million overnight. But nevertheless, <laughs> it's the longest four-week trial run ever in the history of television, I think. Well, I suppose that's true. I mean, it staggered on to that four weeks, not doing very well, and then they put other things in its place. But they really couldn't find anything. They tried TV Scrabble and Jeopardy and all sorts of things. And they kept coming back to it. So it was on and it was off, and then it was moved to 4.30. It did a bit better, and then... They put afternoon programmes before it. I mean, it just started from a standing start, remember, just with a test card. So, And then it got a million viewers, and then it got in the Channel 4 Top 10, and, you know, then it went 13 weeks on, 13 weeks off. Well, I have to say that the game is the thing. I mean, it's this very simple game. I mean, the long-running shows, what's my line? You know, someone comes on and does a mime, and you just have to guess his job. The simple shows are often the best. We are a very low-tech show. You know, if we were starting from scratch now, we'd probably have computer graphics and uh, the dictionary words would be on the screen or on, the, on, a, on, a, on a computer and all that kind of thing. But we're deliciously low-tech. So I think people like the game.